everyone loves a good day on the water. No matter where you are, the water always makes everything better. But at the end of the day, isn't it always nice to come home to one thing? A good meal. All that time you spent fishing out on the water. Just think of how good of a meal you can have once you fry up all that catfish. Mmm, sure looks good to me. But wait, something might be putting our catfish in danger? Existing in all aquatic habitats, on the surface of seawaters, deep within seawaters, rivers, lakes, or ponds, are one of the most abundant life forms on Earth. A group of organisms no larger than one to two millimeters target and infect these fish we know and love. Not only that, these parasites also have the ability to target and infect a vast range of species, from sponges to whales. They are the parasitic copepods. Given their origin in shallow coast water, it can be surprising how copepods have evolved to dominate the entire ocean. Some of the more primitive species are found in mixed sea freshwater caves, which provides clues to how they invaded the ocean. Let's head over to Auburn University to speak with our own expert on copepod parasites, Mr. Carlos Ruiz. So we think the parasite came here from, from Germany, mm -hmm. and it was transported here either with live fish or even came in like frozen fish, because mm. we know now that those things are tough. They... The history of copepods is being untangled due to documented specimens in various cave sites throughout the Caribbean and islands in the South Pacific. The original colonization of these caves, along with other parts of the ocean, occurred at least 100 million years ago. Neurogasilus japonicus, a parasitic copepod, is believed to have been introduced to North America from its origin in Eastern Asia through aquarium trade, aquaculture, or even ballast water from ships. Since its first documented occurrence in Alabama in 1993, it has also been documented in the Great Lakes and Colorado. Copepods have targeted unlucky fish, specifically their gills, since the lower crustacea period, about 110 to 120 million years ago. Nearly 30 families of copepods contain parasites that utilize fish as hosts. The infection process involves the targeted journey of a copepod larva. Less than one millimeter long in body length, lurking through its enormous water habitat in search of a host to attack. Continuing their journey that leads to successful reproduction, parasitic copepods damage their hosts directly by their attachment mechanisms and by their feeding activities. How do they do this? Through a quite painful process for the host, that is. Attachment by means of clawed limbs is typical for ectoparasites and penetration of the skin by the claws causes local lesions. On the skin of fish, attachment can cause less than pleasurable signs that lets its host know that it has an unwelcomed invader. Symptoms like cell death and loss of the outer layer of skin can lead to responses such as swelling, organ and tissue enlargement, and cellular infiltration. When it comes to feeding, most parasitic copepods rasp at the surface of the host using their mandibles. When it's time for the parasites to reproduce, a male copepod will hold the female in an embrace until the female copepod is ready to be fertilized. Once fertilized, disc-shaped eggs develop on an egg string and after hatching, larvae only take one to two days before starting their parasitic life cycle. We found all of this pretty interesting, so we went with our parasitologist, Carlos Ruiz, to capture some fish in the field. Carlos and his team used a bag saying to capture infected fish so we could get a closer look at these deadly parasites. The results were impressive. We found dozens of infected fish in the very first pool. But we know you'd like to experience as close to first hand as possible what we got to see in the field. Let's see how the team works together to pull up infected fish. Back. 
this small yet mighty parasite has evolved and reproduced to affect one of the world's largest industries, aquaculture. Those things are tough. They resist desiccation, they resist um, um, freezing, um, they can get transmitted by animals that just eat infected fish, mm -hmm. like they can, they can withstand high pHs basically, right. you know. They don't die. Um, they, they don't, don't like die. die. <laughs> the infestation of the parasite results in the fish's loss of ability to grow and survive in order to produce plentiful offspring for the market. The decline of one particular product, remember that fish we were frying earlier? Well, due to the fish being infested with copepod parasites, the economy is largely impacted due to less strong and healthy fish being available. It is difficult to spot the parasites in the field, and even for someone with a trained eye, it's quite easy to overlook the creatures due to their almost microscopic size, which could lead to the spread of these copepods to other parts of North America. If this happens, we could see a dramatic decrease in the availability of fish throughout the area. But now that you're aware of the issue, maybe you can help find ways to solve it. One simple way to help is to show your support by visiting the Auburn University Museum of Natural History located in the Biodiversity Learning Center building on Mill Street.